Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Lubar Center here at Marquette University Law School, Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing uh, interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today we are joined by Bud Selig. He is the former commissioner of Major League Baseball. He led baseball from 1992 to 2015 when he retired. He was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2017. As most of you in this room know, he is a former owner of the Milwaukee Brewers. He is also a lecturer here at Marquette University Law School. And I'm delighted to see so many of our students uh, here today with us who are interested in the sports law program. And the National Sports Law Institute, in fact, is a co-sponsor of today's event. Uh, among the other things that Bud Selig has done, at least in recent times, is write a book. And this is it. For the good of the game, the inside story of the surprising and dramatic transformation of Major League Baseball. Won't you please welcome Bud Selig to Marquette University of Washington. Great to have you with us. And you'll, you'll be back teaching again this, uh, this yeah, fall. Yeah, my first appearance here will be September 11th, and it is nice to be here. I just want to say, aside, Mike and I have done a lot of this over the last <laughs> 20, 25 years. Yes, yes, it's been a few. Sometimes in good times and sometimes in not so good times. Yeah, yeah. we've had a lot of history together, so uh, we have. We've we're delighted. One, wonderful. You know, delighted to have you here again today. Uh, I'm wondering when you were writing this book um, and with your uh, uh, Phil Rogers, who's a highly respected baseball writer, as you were writing this, did you ever have a chance to, to books are pressure, you got to get them done, you're writing under deadlines, but I'm wondering if you actually had a chance to sit back and say, wow, what a life I've led. This is almost surreal for a young kid from Milwaukee. Well, I did, I can tell you, the morning uh, when, that, when that hit me, um, the book you know, I'm teaching at three universities, and I'm always busy and hectic, but the morning I got up in Cooperstown, happy to say that Mr. Lubar was there also, mm -hmm. and um, it's a beautiful morning in upstate New York, and um, I just sat and started thinking, and, and I thought to myself, who could have ever dreamed back in the 50s when I was in college and then out, and even in the early and mid-60s when the Braves left town, and I remember all that, and oh man, it was, we were in litigation, and you know all the things that we right. went through. To think that someday I'd wind up in the Hall of Fame, which is, of course, the highest honor you can achieve, and it just struck me, and the only thought I had then still do is I wish my mother and father could be there mm -hmm. because, um, as I say in the dedication of the book, you know, the book is really dedicated to them. My mother, as you know, was a huge fan. Huge fan. Yeah. As I go around the country, the fact that my mother is one who got me interested in baseball <laughs> seems to stun a lot of people. <laughs> but she was you, the bigger fan, wasn't she? Oh, yeah. huge. Yeah. If you knew my mother, you wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. She. Um, she was a school teacher mm -hmm. through all her days, I may add, and tough. And, but um, at an early age, she was always listening to the Brewers, Brewers of the American Association, minor league team. Mm -hmm. And Borchard Field was where they played. And when I was four, five, six, seven, she started taking me to games. And. Um, it, of course, all in the book, my 15th birthday, uh, she took me to New York. Now, she had other ideas, other than she had baseball, and she loved it, but she wanted to go to museums, and she had a lot of places for me to go, and I wanted to see the Dodgers, the Giants, and the Yankees. And, uh, but we did accommodate all that, but I guess the story I tell in the book, and I'll tell you because it doesn't. So now on my 15th birthday, we're sitting in the upper deck in Yankee Stadium. That's a thrill for me. I had become a Yankee fan for the strange, inexplicable reason that my favorite Milwaukee Brewer had been traded to the Yankees. And then, of course, I became a Joe DiMaggio fan, which wasn't hard to do, by the way. And so here we are in Yankee Stadium. And, you know, there wasn't much television in those days. So this is a, this is a thrill. And it's my 15th birthday. And 
about 10 to 1, they're wheeling a big cake out. Now, you know, I'm a 15-year-old who thinks that the world revolves around me. <laughs> and I say to my mother, how could you do this to me? <laughs> and she looks at me and says, what are you talking about? I said, the birthday cake. Oh, this is embarrassing. And um, she just went like this, got that stern look on her face, and now the PA announcer, Bob Shepard, as a matter of fact, announcing that birthday and please rise, it's the great manager of the New York Yankee, Casey Stengel's birthday today. So, so Casey and I shared a birthday. And, and the only other story, just along that line, that's in there, Mike, um, we go to Boston. And um, we're going to Fenway Park, and the Yankees are coming up their biggest series of the year, and Fenway Park is something that you want to see. Of course, she has a lot of other ideas. She's got art museums and so on. She wants to go to the game. We come up to the ticket window. I'll never forget it. And a typical Bostonian says, bang, he brings the window down. He says, sold out. We have no tickets left. And my mother says, you can't do that. I brought my boy here from Milwaukee. Well, this guy didn't give a damn where the hell we were from. <laughs> At least been interested. Sorry. And so we walk around Fenway Park for, I don't know, an hour. And, and it's 1979, 30 years later. The Brewers are having a big year. George Bamberger's second year. We won 95 games that year. but. We were going to Boston. My mother said to me, buddy, I think I'd like to go. Fine. Glad to have you. So she goes. And um, <clears throat> we get there, and our traveling secretary takes her down to a seat right next to the dugout in the first row. And I went to the clubhouse, came back. And I get back, and she looks again in her stern way and says, huh, this is a little different than it was 30 years ago, isn't it? And I yeah. said, yeah, it is. It was a little different. Yeah. I've got to ask you about the way you started this book. The book begins with Barry Bonds chasing of the, the home run record. It's 2007. You're traveling around the country to be there mm -hmm. when the record is broken. And you describe yourself in the first chapter of the book as being absolutely miserable. People who knew you knew you were miserable. A, why were you miserable? And B, um, why, why did you feel the way you did about Bonds? Well, um, and we started that way. Actually, it was Phil Rogers' idea. I have to give him credit, but he was right. The world knew how I felt. Mistakenly, um, I think, because they knew, as you know in the book, my very, very close personal relationship with Henry Allen mm -hmm. to this day. And um, people said, well, he feels badly because he's going to break Aaron's record, who of course broke Babe Ruth's record, and he does that because of his relationship. Well, it wasn't that wasn't true at all. In fact, this was ten days following Barry around, and I guess I'd have to say to you that there were people on the Bataan death march that had a better time than I had in that yeah. ten days. <laughs> and um, but I was the commissioner, and I felt I should be there, and. Um, he tied the record in San Diego, and I remember Tom Hicks, who owns the Rangers, said, well, you, aren't you going to get up? Well, I did, but painfully. <laughs> the nicest part was uh, Henry sensed how I felt, and he called me every morning. It was really remarkable. Wherever I was, are you doing okay? I am. I'm doing fine. And uh, he never said any more. Just we would talk about baseball, or he'd make conversation, or I'd make conversation. But you know, I was in the midst of, and that's really one of the reasons for writing the book of the steroid crisis, proud of how it's come out. It was a tremendous fight, as you know, with the Players Association. And I, I think even if Don Fear and Gene Orza, who were, the, you know, were here this morning, they wouldn't doubt because they fought it publicly. And, um, and so the whole thing bothered me. Um, um, I have a great belief in baseball as a social institution. I have a great belief in the responsibility of baseball and its players to, as I say, do the right thing, because you'll hear the social institution theory of mine maybe many times today. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's why it bothered me, Mike. I, I, there's, there's no other reason than that. Um, Barry and I actually had um, 
for a long time, a pretty good relationship. And in fact, I solved a lot of problems for the Giants. He used to call me in spring training. And I, we live in Arizona, not far from Scottsdale Stadium, so I'd go over there. And, and, um, but near the end, it, it was painful. Mm -hmm. You uh, uh, talked in this book about the time when you became acting commissioner, so 1992. Right. And uh, you used colorful language to describe what you inherited, which was a nightmare. There was an adjective in front of nightmare, but it yeah, was... Yeah, one, uh, one I'm sorry to yeah. say I use often. <laughs> and by the way, well, I'll tell you a quick story about that. One day we lose a game in the eighth or ninth inning. My mother had the box next to mine. I don't know that she can hear through the wall. She's there with her bridge playing partners. And the next morning I come to the office and my assistant, Laurie Keck, who had heard all kinds of language, had been Vince Lombardi's secretary for 11 years, said, your mother called. Well, I knew when my mother called early in the morning, that wasn't good news. Mm -hmm. So I pick up the phone, and she said, you were not raised that way. I never heard such horrible language. <laughs> but anyway, I, I left the word in because everybody wanted me to. I do mm -hmm. use it, and, and it, I did inherit a mess in 1992 everywhere. We had no labor agreement, we had no economic, we had no revenue sharing, we, we had no marketing tool. I mean, wherever I turned. Um, why, why were owners, and players for that matter, so resistant to change? Well, baseball is a social institution. I warned them they're going to hear this. And social institutions, by their indigenous nature, I guess, are just resistant to change. No, look, in everything in life, people don't like change, including me. And so the first thing I did just to break that chain of 50 years was to go to wild card, September of 93. Well, we passed it. American League mm -hmm. wavered a little bit, and the future president of the United States, we had to change his vote. But, but all that worked. George W. Bush. George yeah. W. Was involved with the Texas And, Rangers, um, yeah. and he, um, um, you would have thought that I had defied motherhood. Why, Bob, poor Bob Costas, and I'm a dope. I, on Sunday, he'd have a two-hour radio show, and I'd be sitting on my radio listening to him rip me for two hours. <laughs> and um, it was horrible. Oh, this guy from Milwaukee is ruining the game. And well, where would we be today without the wild card? And by the way, this year, more than ever, I, a lot of and all the things that have worked so wonderfully well, no more criticism, but that's just the way things go. Why were you able to achieve success? Because when you talk about change, if you look at the history of Major League Baseball, the change that occurred, the transformation that occurred, right. is pretty remarkable. I mean, you, you're citing the wild card, but there's interleague play, there's revenue sharing, there's drug testing, there's new ballparks, there's uh, the social media, the advent of social media, which has right. been a godsend to Major League Baseball. Right. All those things happened during your tenure. Why were you able to achieve that? Well, I really don't know. You know, that's a... Your style? Question. Well, number one, I grew up with all these people. Now, you, let me start by saying, because it's a great question. For years while I was interim, they were putting a lot of pressure on me to take the job, and my wife wanted me to take the job. And um, I didn't want to tell her. Finally, one night, I sort of grew tired of listening to that, well, buddy, what's the matter with you? And um, I said, well, the eight people that have preceded me either died in office or got fired. And, and I don't like those odds. <laughs> and. Um, but it worked out great. So I had grown up with them. Oh. And um, I have to say the owners get a lot of marks, mostly bad, in all sport. But they never, they were great with me. And um, I spent endless hours, Mike, every day. Because I knew that my job, and I think the job of any CEO, is to get people to do things and to cooperate, and to do what's in the best interest of the institution. And therefore, I had seen in my years in baseball, the most successful people in America, some of them, who'd come to meeting, didn't know what the meeting was about, didn't care, and the commissioners were 
I, I could give you, a, and I liked all of them. I mean, I really did. I liked all of them, but there were things that I learned. And one thing I realized in 1992 and until the day I left there is my job was to make sure that we do what's in for the good of the game, in the best interest. And so when we come to a meeting, and we can tell the story about BAM, I think, at some point, which is really, mm -hmm. um, really illustrative of that point, I didn't want anybody not to be, feel part of it, and so they understood, and it caused me to spend endless hours every day with people. But the owners, in the end, were great. You know, even on the steroid thing, which aggravates me to this day, well, the owners were slow to react. And then, no, they weren't. They were great. They wanted a steroid policy. Not one owner ever said to me, don't do it. And when it came to revenue sharing, certainly the thing I'm proudest of, and I think the reason that baseball is doing as well as it's doing, um, yes, there were big market clubs that were not happy. And there were a couple of them that, you know, threw roadblocks up and this thing. But in the end, painful, moved slowly. But in the end, they did. And that's why I came for the good of the game. What would have happened, Commissioner, if, if you had not done revenue sharing? You talk about this in the book. What would have happened? Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about that this morning. David Glass, who was chairman of Walmart, bought the Royals. Wonderful man. And Kansas City is a market much like Milwaukee. Said to me, I guess about 98 or 99, 2000, Commissioner, if you hadn't done this, 10 or 12 of us would have been out of business by now. And that would have included the Milwaukee Brewers because we couldn't go on. I, had, I appointed a, a Blue Ribbon Committee, Mike, in 98, Paul Volcker, mm -hmm. um, George. Uh, Will, George Mitchell, and uh, Rick Levin, the president of Yale, who was an accomplished, account, brilliant economist. And um, to do things I knew already existed, but I, and uh, they were very independent, very aggressive. Into the second meeting, Paul Volcker knocked on my door in New York and said, we'd like to see you. Yes, sir, happy to see you guys. And I've been friends with all four of them, but this was a different type of thing. I walked in the room, and Mr. Volker, remember, big, tall guy, smoking a cigar. In those days, you could still smoke in the building, and he was smoking a cigar. Said, you got 25 teams that can't win under any circumstance. I knew that already. And um, David Glass is right. So um, there's no question revenue sharing took a long time, a lot of pain, went through a lot. But you know, when I went to Kansas City, in 14 and 15, and they were in the World Series. Won one of them, lost to the Giants and the other. And the people in Kansas City were wonderful, as they always are here. And they, all they did is thank me. And that really meant a lot to me, because without what we did, they wouldn't have been there. And, and so um, there was a period from 98 to about 2003 where, man, it was, we had no revenue sharing. I inherited a, a system like not a nickel. And given the modern sports today, you can't have a league where you have Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and, and St. Louis and Kansas City and Milwaukee and on and on and on, and then you have New York and Boston. That just doesn't work and won't work. Because the job of a commissioner, or the job maybe of any CEO, is to provide hope and faith that was my key at every meeting. We're here to provide hope and faith to as many people as possible. And, um, and so those were the two words that owners heard at every meeting. Probably got tired of it, but it didn't matter. They're going to hear it anyway. But, and it's true. So on March 28th, when they opened the season, which is too early, but that's a whole other story, um, <laughs> Your, your job is to provide as much hope and faith in as many places as possible. Not that they can win the pennant, but that they can be competitive. And that's the objective. You said at the beginning of this program that you and I have known each other for a while. And, and, uh, and so some of this book, uh, parts of it seem familiar, kind of lived through some of those same experiences that you lived through. Uh, but there were a couple of things in here that to me were complete surprises. And I want to ask you about them. 
The first one uh, takes us to uh, the White House in 1995. And baseball uh, is in the midst of a pretty ugly strike. Yep. Uh, not, not pretty, very. Very ugly strike. Uh, no World Series in 94. Still haven't figured a way out of this. And so President Clinton offers to get involved and try and bring the two sides together, the players' union and uh, the ownership. And uh, so you're at the White House, and you get into what I'll call uh, an intense discussion with Vice President Gore. Mm -hmm. And in keeping with our theme today, um, I guess we could say you F-bombed the Vice President <laughs> in the White House. On multiple occasions. On multiple <laughs> occasions. Why were you so angry? Well, here's what happened. In We Lose the World Series, which broke my heart. I'll never forget that night that I, I called off the world. I didn't call it off. The players were on strike. But that's another story that maybe. Well, I, you had to do it. I had no choice. And so I replayed in my mind that night. I had one of my little granddaughters there, and I can, so she can, couldn't understand why I was so sad. Every World Series I remember starting in 1944. But on the 14th, or 13th of October, I get a call from the White House. Would you come tomorrow? They, they didn't ask, would you? You'll be here tomorrow. I'm fine, I'll be there tomorrow. I knew what it was. I had done a lot of checking. David Glass, again, who was the, was the chairman of Walmart, and Hillary was on his board. So he, I called him right away, and he said, well, they want to appoint an arbitrator, Bill Ussery. Great history. I'll get to that in a second. Great history. And I said, well, you know, the clubs aren't going to want to do that. Yes, David said, you're right, but if you tell them they got to do it, they'll do it. Well, I checked him out, and he had a great reputation. Tough. Had started with Harry Truman. He was the most famous labor mediator in American history. So now I go to the White House, and the president's very gracious, sorry about everything that's happened, but he said, we got to solve this thing. You work with you and your owners work with us three in baseball, union will do that, and we'll accept anything that he comes up with. Well, when the President of the United States asked you to do that, and again, I hate to bore you, but we are a social institution, and that's our responsibility. So now we fight and argue the next three or four months with Mr. Usry, who's a wonderful man, but tough and fair, very fair. And uh, in early February, I get a call. I had a committee of 12 people in labor, and my daughter was one of them, and she and uh, Andy McPhail, who at that time was with the tw twins, both called together and said, you better get here. There's a rumor that he might be coming out with something. I get to Washington right away. Sure enough, 7 o'clock the next morning, Bill S. calls. Well, what... Um, he says, can you meet me for breakfast? <laughs> yeah, you kidding? Yeah, when, uh, where and when? Well, he's downstairs. Oh, get ready, get down. He gives me his plan. It, it's not great by any stretch of the imagination, but better than I thought he would do. And obviously, he's a man trying to be fair. So he says, you'll hear from me shortly. I said, look, Bill, much as we've argued and fought, and I really liked him a lot personally, we gave the president our word, the baseball, and gave a word that they'd accept what you come up with. Okay. Now he goes to see the union. Now we don't hear. Well, it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. I have my whole committee there, and I'm saying the committee, especially Jerry Reinsdorf and John, Johnny Harrington of the Boston Red Sox, who are with me. We got troubles here, guys. Something wrong. Five o'clock, we call every senator we know and friends, and nobody's heard a word. Senator Mitchell, who, who was gone by that time, I'm particularly close, and it was very close to Leon Panetta, who was the chief of staff, and so he, he, George called Leon, but he couldn't get anything out of him. We get to the White House at seven, and there's the union, and um, a lot of players. I've got three or four owners, and the uh, president is there, vice president is there, George Stephanopoulos is there, Robert Reich, the labor secretary, little guy, 
don't, didn't like them then, don't like them today. <laughs> and um, Leon Panetta, whom I like a lot to this day. And um, well, there's just a lot of noise, not, nothing. I can't figure out what's happening. I see, I look at Usri. And that's my key. Usri looks. So now we take a break after about a half hour. Now remember, we both had given our word we we're going to accept what he said. So I'm just walking in the hallway, stunned, trying to figure out how I'm going to explain to 30 owners who didn't want to do this, especially George Steinbrenner, how you got uh, screwed by the President of the United States. And there's Bill Ussery. Wonderful history. He looks at me. He's as close to me as Mr. Lubar is here. Harry S. Truman didn't do this to me. Dwight David Eisenhower didn't do this to me. John F. Kennedy didn't do it to me. Lyndon Baines Johnson didn't do it to me. He says, even that son of a bitch Richard Nixon didn't do this to me. <laughs> and he goes right up the line. What are you talking about? And he has an economist with him, Herb Fishgold. Brilliant guy. Brilliant guy. And I can see they're both crushed. Now I realize what's happened. So now Leon Panetta comes and says, I just talked to our friend George. He sent his regard. And yeah, great. That's wonderful. But he said, the president would like to see you. And I, now I'm on a couch with the president. And he says, well, look, you know, now I've heard what's happened because one of my guys has picked it up, that he went back to the Union, and Gene Orza, who's second in command. And, and if you've read the book, you know that Gene and I don't like one another, and that's a mild understatement. And um, Gene Count called him a senile bastard and rejected it. Now, remember, we had an agreement. And the president's talking to me, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do here? I always remember, Mike, I'm sitting on the couch thinking, I wish my mother and dad were here. They could see I'm here. I'm sitting talking to the President of the United States. But it wasn't, he wasn't bad. He was just, look, we can't do it, Commissioner, and blah, blah, blah. Next thing, the door opens, and there they all are. And uh, the President, smart as he is, he bolts out the door. So now the meeting starts again, and the vice president gets up, and he says, um, I'm tired of the little guys. I'm thinking to myself, what the hell is he talking about? It's just me. Um, he says, little guys have caused trouble. So he spent the day with the union. Now he's talking about the small markets. What? And this goes on for a couple minutes. Bob Reich is standing, nodding his agreement, which made me madder, of course. And if you weren't all here and I could use the language I use, I would tell you what I think of him. <laughs> and finally, after this and that, and I can't, now there's about a thousand media people outdoors, huge coverage. And I listen, and he, he's nasty. And I'm thinking to myself, we made an agreement. If we came in here and busted that agreement, they'd kill us. It's an old line about, and I use in the book over, baseball is always held to a higher standard, which is a comp great compliment, but tough when you're the commissioner. And when he starts, I'm tired of you, of the little guys that you represent, he says to me, and that's when I exploded. And, um, Later on, Leon Panetta told George Mitchell, who told me at 3 o'clock that morning, that's the greatest temper tantrum I've ever seen. <laughs> well, I didn't mean for it to be, but I, I want to repeat. When you give somebody your word, that's it. And they took the greatest labor mediator in American history and did that to him and to us, and it caused us years of heartache. And so um, I finally did say to him, dropping multiple F-bombs, I'm going out and tell the press, F-press, 
how you, what you have done here today, and then you explain. And by the way, I want you to go to Milwaukee, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Kansas City, Cincinnati, and tell them that they don't deserve a Major League Baseball team. Now go blank yourself. <laughs> and not surprisingly, the meeting ended quickly. <laughs> And um, so that's the story. And, and I didn't go out and do that because we had to keep being, and it led to a lot of heartache, a lot of heartache. And that's what David Glass was going Baseball went through a tough period, which is the title of the book. So, yeah. um, Just to be clear, you were not a contributor to the Al Gore for president campaign in, uh, in 2000? That would be a fair statement. That would statement. be a fair yeah. statement, okay. <laughs> So the other, the other thing that I did not know, and this is uh, for people who are from Milwaukee, you may have some uh, familiarity with this, this story, but, but there are parts of it that I had never heard before, and I would appreciate you sharing with us today. So back in the early 80s, one of the best players on the Milwaukee Brewers was Paul Molitor. He's now in the Hall of Fame, tremendous player. Uh, he came clean as, as time passed, and I remember interviewing him, and he talked about his problem with cocaine, which is a a problem in baseball and in society at that time. And he said, I could have been in prison, I could have been dead. Um, so he had, he had wrestled with it and, and I think in his own mind come to, come to some conclusions about how he was behaving. But in this book, you tell a story about the arrest of a guy who was known as Milwaukee's co cocaine kingpin, mm -hmm. Tony Peters, young guy who lived on the east side of Milwaukee. And you tell a story about that, and it connects us again to Paul Molitor. Can you tell that story for people in here? Yeah, one night I'm at the ballpark about 6 o'clock, my phone rings. And um, it's a guy I had met, actually through Bob Euchre, amazingly so. And, um, and I love Bob, and this FBI man. Who, and he said, this is so-and-so. I need to see you right away. I said, well, I'm, I'll be here all day tomorrow. He says, I mean right away. Ooh. And I said, okay. He said, uh, are you at the ballpark now? Yes, sir. That's when I've answered my phone. Can you come out? And he said, I will. And he was there in about 10 minutes. And he was a little interesting guy and really impressive. And he said, look, I got bad news for you. And um, I need you to stay with me tonight because you're going to have to protect one of your players. What? What are you talking about? And you, you've just nailed it with Tony Peters. And so to make a long story short, I couldn't tell. He said, you can't tell anybody. Well, I said, you know, i got to tell my family. They'll wonder where the hell I am. And he said, you're not telling anybody. Okay? I couldn't drop any F-bombs with him. So mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir, and that's it. And to make a long story short, as as the book describes, we, um, we get the thing at least settled to a point where Paul is neither bad. Look, I love Paul Molitor. I want you to know I just, he and I just had a nice long visit in Cooperstown, and I, I, um, I, I'm very protective of my players to this day. And don't have to be, but in this case, uh, Paulie was not only a great player, but he was, in, he was great on the field, off the field. But this was one of those instances. We had a cocaine problem in baseball, by the way, in the 80s, a bad problem. Pittsburgh drug trials, 29 players got convicted, four went to jail. That's why the whole baseball drug thing is such a miracle. Sport never had a program, went through this awful cocaine thing. And so to think today we have the toughest testing program in, in not only in sports but in America is a wonderful story. It doesn't get told enough, but it's one of the reasons for writing the book. So, um, but that was the Paul Molitor story. And um, was he at the house on the night of the arrest? Was he at the at Tony Peters' house on yes. the night of the arrest? Yeah. It was a it was a it was a different time. And I think one of the interesting things that I found in the book was that. You now look back at that, and you're, you're, you're a guy who pays attention to history, and you look back at the cocaine problem that existed then, and you said, in some respects, that should have been a warning sign to us. No question. You know, it's interesting. Um, we never had a drug testing. Marvin Miller, the famed head of the union who founded the union, and um, 
Who's my one bit of controversy? I believe he should be in the Hall of Fame, and I've heard from everybody in baseball who doesn't agree with me. That's okay. Uh, all right, Tom, this is America, you know, land of the free, home of the brave. You can have your own opinion, even if I don't agree with it. But um, um, he was against drug testing. And so we go through the heartache of cocaine. And it was a real heartache in the 80s. And even in the 90s, as we got going and the steroid thing was beginning to, Marvin said, if I were still there, and you have to understand Marvin's huge influence on Don and others, Don Fira, mm -hmm. um, if I was there, nobody would be peeing in a bottle, was his direct quote. Well, and that's what makes what happened Tough as it was, and uh, baseball was slow to react, untrue. But the union fought us. I mean, it was a vicious. I could detail it out, but we'd be here all afternoon. My students have heard a lot of this, and it's, it's true. So, but you're right, there was a warning sign. Let me give you a warning sign, Mike. There was a big, lanky, left-handed relief pitcher by the name of Steve Howe. Steve Howe pitched for a lot of clubs. Good, pretty good. Great Dodgers pitcher. Yes, he was. That's where he had his. Mm -hmm. And he got seven times clubs suspended him because he was using cocaine. He got out every time. Commissioners suspended him. It was brutal. But the union won. They were good. They were tough. He had a career. And guess what happened two years after his career was over? He overdosed and died. So who was doing who a favor? These are the kind of conversations that we'd have. Don Fear and I always had a reasonable relationship. I mean, and I used to talk to him about stuff like this. It gets back to the social institution theory, but it's true. And they said, well, it violates a player's right of privacy. Look. The most important thing a commissioner can do, or anybody can do, is to make sure that the game is as clean as possible. Integrity. For the good of the game. Call it anything that you want. And so, when a few people are taking steroids, which are terrible for their health, by the way. I spent more times. I just got a letter today from the Baltimore Orioles team doctor who was in it, and he, rem he had read my book, and he read And I would say, I once said to Don, I'll tell you a story. I think it's, uh, um, Don lived, Don's parents lived near us in Scottsdale. And um, so, Shell, you know the walking around. I'm walking one day, here comes a guy with funny outfit and it's Don Fair. So nobody in the world would believe but he says to me, you mind if I walk with you? I no, come on. And we walked and very pleasant and until we got on steroids and that was still pleasant. But I asked him the basic question. I said, someday you and I are not going to have these jobs forever. I'm going to retire and I did and he's Tired from that job, and now he's the head of the hockey union. But I said to him, what happens if a widow of one of these players comes and says, you guys knew, and you didn't do anything about it? What would you say to her? You know, he talked about right of privacy and Marvin Miller and all the things that I had already heard 8,000 times. But it's true. You, you, we met with doctors. And Don would come to some meetings. I'd invite him. Doctors from all 30 teams. We, I, we hired Dr. Gary Green from UCLA, who was a leading expert and still there. Great doctor, great man, great man. And you talked about liver cancer and all the things that steroids could do. And I, I said to him at the time, look, this is terrible, but it's terrible for the players. And then there's a story that came up in one of my congressional, early congressional hearings, which was a disaster because of them, really, but, oh. but the first two, the first two witnesses 
was a man named Don Hooten and a man named Bob Garibaldi whose sons had committed suicide because of steroids. They were both baseball players. And I was there early in the morning. I didn't realize what a terrible day it would be. It started out terrible and got worse. But I was so stunned listening to them. I was appalled. Oh, my God. And don't let any athlete ever tell you, they're role models. Whether Charles Barkley believes it or not is irrelevant. And I called Mr. Hooten the next morning. Got his number, called him. He didn't want to believe it was me. And uh, he said, ah, who's playing a joke on me? I said, well, I don't know. Anyway, he called me back. I had him call me back. And we made a deal that exists to this day. He does hoot and chalk talks in every inner city and every major league city, all on steroids. We're the only one doing it now, but good. I, I, and he's been wonderful. But it was a tough, that's what, I really wrote the book because of the steroid thing is seemingly so misunderstood. And I hope it isn't after this, at least my side of it isn't, and our, our side of it isn't. But it was... It was painful, but in the end, if you're the hitter, and Mr. Lubar is the pitcher, he's got a good fastball, by the way, and um, he's taking steroids and you're not, it's, that affects the integrity of the sport. But on that point, do you think there will come a time as the years march on where baseball will begin to induct people into the Hall of Fame who posted numbers that were just completely out of character for other parts of their career and who are suspected, at the very least, of having used steroids. Well, there are some people in already who some people suspect. I, I'm going to leave that one to the writers. It's a complicated issue. Um, I've never, I, I know, you know, you have the Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens scenario. Um, and they got three more years to go, and then whether any committee ever puts them in the Hall of Fame is another story, but, you know, that whole issue, I spent so many sleepless nights in this, I'll tell you a story. After this hearing, I was at the Hall of Fame because commissioners have dinner with the Hall of Famers alone. And that year, 05, they were angry. There were a lot of old timer Bob Feller, George Kell. I mean, they were guy, and they were really angry. And then ang angry with me. They were tough on me, Reggie Jackson. And um, when I left there that night, I really I could see how much it had impacted them. They loved the game. They were the greatest stars. That Sandy Koufax. I mean, it was incredible. So I said to myself, coming home to Milwaukee that night, when John McCain calls again, because he already told me he was going to call, and he and I, he had begun to understand, I'm, I'm going to say this, he, had, he and Fear had been on the U.S. Olympic Committee together, and um, so they were alleged friends. Well, that friendship had already sort of begun to break apart. I'm going to let these guys, I'm going to bring some of these guys to the next hearing. Sure enough, the next morning, about 11.30, my secretary of Ari Keck says to me, John McCain's on the phone, he's on himself. I mean, now there was no, wow. So we talked for a minute, and, and uh, he, of course, he knew I was in Phoenix a lot, so we, we would see each other. And he said, I want, I want to have a hearing in two weeks. I'm, this is awful, and blah, blah, blah. And he, I know, I agree with you. I, I think I know you do. I said, I have an idea, Senator. I said, I, I tell him, as I just told you, where I was and what I heard. And I said, I'd like to bring five or six of these people. I'd like to bring one from each generation. Oh, and he, I could tell, he said, oh, may I ask you, who would you bring? Well, I start with Henry Aaron. As soon as I said Henry Aaron, I didn't have to bring anybody else. And um, I hadn't talked to anybody yet, so I was winging it, but I said, he said, well, it'll be two weeks. And so I called Henry, and he, as always, was great. What do you want me to do? When do you want me to do it? I said, two weeks, we'll be in Washington. And I got Robin Roberts, great pitcher from the 50s. 
Ryan Sandberg of the Cubs, the latest one, and on and on and on. Phil Negro, Lou Brock. We have a dinner the night before as to what they're going to say. And um, I got up just to thank them all for coming, how much it meant to me, and they were happy to be there. And I said, anybody want to say anything? No, they had all written what they were going to say, and that was it. Good. No, so this was... And that night, after we got done eating, we ate like we were going to the electric chair at 11 o'clock, and um, Henry Aaron said to me, let's walk back. Or we did. And um, one of the nicest things happened to me in that walk back, it's on the cover of the book, in a way. We were at a corner, and he said to me, and Henry, I had been, Henry and I had been friends since 1958, so we were then 24 years old. And he, he looked at me and he said, not with any, just the two of us, nobody heard, nobody said anything. Who would have dreamed when we met that someday I'd break Babe Ruth's record, the most famous record in sports, and you'd be the commissioner of baseball? We were just two kids in 1958. And we both shrugged our shoulders and kept walking, and he wrote that, of course, on the cover of the book. And, and the next day, I wish you all could have been there. They called John, Senator McCain who was really fair and really, in the end, and he, uh, he went crazy that day on, on Don Fair, which <laughs> didn't make me unhappy. And um, Henry st started, and it had brought tears to your eyes. And the rest of them were great. Ryan Sandberg was out of this world. He was tremendous. And so it turned from there on. I, that was my last hearing. I've never been back to Washington, thank God, for small favors, as my mother used to say. I don't, but um, it, really, it, it really worked well. So then everybody knew who was the problem and why they were the problem. There are uh, great stories in this book about uh, your efforts as a, as a young fellow to bring baseball back to Milwaukee after the Braves left. We could talk about that. We could talk about the building of Miller Park and the process involved, and I know you've said that in some respects is one of your biggest disappointments. Not the fact that Miller Park got built, but the process that led up to it. But I, I want to uh, leave just a couple minutes for, for questions and for our students if you have any questions. Um, and I want to close by saying this. You, you say at the end of this book that baseball is thriving. And I know you've gotten some pushback from people who say, yeah, Attendance is down, uh, television ratings are down, this fascination with analytics, launch angles, exit velocities, extreme shifts is ruining the game. You hear that. What's your response to that? Well, I do, and am I, if there are any of my students here that listen to it, let me tell you a story. I am a history buff, so you gather that. 1958, the year Henry, Aaron, and I met. Well, I'm 24 years old, and the sports editor of the Milwaukee Journal, a man named Oliver E. Keekley. Ali Keekley, yeah. Yes, Ali Keekley, who became a friend but was one miserable. Well, <laughs> anyway, um, so I got to control myself. Here. <laughs> and he writes a column that baseball is moribund. It's dying. The younger generation won't accept it. And oh, and he goes to Dallas to the Associated Press Sports Editors Convention, and he gets nationwide publicity. So, Mike, I've been listening to that for 63 years. And I know what we're drawing, and our attendance may or may not be down. By the way, every major sport was down a little. But let me just share some numbers with you. Because if we're more abundant, boy, I mean, a lot of business like to be more abundant. When I took over in 92, the gross revenue of the sport was a billion two. And it had been stuck at a billion two. Eh, not going anywhere. I used to. My awake at night figuring, how can we ever get this to $2 billion? How can we ever get it to $2 billion? When I left, it was about $11.5 billion. So revenue's going. Today, $13, $13.5 billion. New television contracts. So people who are smart bidding want it and want it badly. I was at Miller Park on... Um, 
Tuesday. And I'm watching the reaction of 37,000 people on a Tuesday night. Here you are in a market of a million four. They're going to draw close to three million people this year. And the more I watch, yes, there are some markets that are weak. You know, look, when you win, you draw, and when you lose, you don't. But you watch the things that go on. And I watch it here, and I watch it in other places. And I'm, I'm proud of where we are. Yes, we'll make some adjustments, and, and, and I think, and I, I hope that some of the clubs that are not drawing well now are, really have young teams and are going to get better. There are 15, 16, 17 teams drawing great. Dodgers are going to draw over 4 million people this year. But think about Milwaukee. The best the Braves ever did was 2-3, and that was a miracle. And uh, we drew 2-3, and Miller Park has been is fabulous. I know the only thing I said about the whole Miller Park thing is that it was the most disappointing human experience of my career. And um, this, did not feel people don't this wasn't you. Walter O'Malley trying to move a team. Yeah. This was a team that desperately wanted to stay here. And uh, quite frankly, we just put up with a lot of political Machiavellianism, I'm going to use better term. I, I, I have much tougher terms, and if you want me to drop an F-bomb here, I would. <laughs> but uh, we'll try not to do that. But, um, but and it got built, and you, every time I drive in there, so many people tailgating and having a good time. And I'll, I'll tell one final story about that line. Bob Harlan, the president of the Packers for many years, was and is to this day one of my closest friends. I, was on the, I am on the board of the Packers. But after we got done with the Miller Park, really tough experience, oh, tough, particularly tough on my daughter, um, I thought Green Bay would be easy. And I said to Bob, Bob and I talk a lot, and I said, you got well, it turned out, Lambeau Field turned out to be as tough as Miller Park. Mm -hmm. And one night he called, and I heard, uh, he called, and I, my wife said, well, he's right here, don't worry, and I'm Bob. Buddy, he said, why does this have to get so personal? And they were accusing Bob and his wife, Madeline, of some real estate deal. And he was going door to door. And by the way, he won with just a little over 50% yeah. of the vote. Mm -hmm. Think it's about close. that. So what I said to him that fateful night, and he reminds me to this day, Bob, Milwaukee and Wisconsin someday will be better off because of Miller Park and Lambeau Field. We may not be here, but someday they'll thank us. Let me take a question or two from, uh, yeah. from the folks in the room. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to look for students first. And then don't be bashful, by the way. All right. <laughs> Let's take, we just got time for a couple. We'll start over here, yes, and speak into the, to the microphone you there. You can do Thanks. more if you want. Hmm? You can do more then. Okay. Excuse, hey there, Commissioner Seating. My name is Wilfredo Navarro. I'm a 2L. Um, recently, they just came out with a video, uh, uh, Netflix, about screwball and biogenesis. Do you have any regrets about the way you guys handled that situation? About biogenesis? No, I'll tell you what happened. Rob Manford, of course, is the commissioner now, was my labor guy and did all that for me. Did it beautifully, by the way. Hard, tough. So I complain about fear and orza, but he, Rob was the guy that had to sit and deal with him. He called one day and said he had bad news. We had been through all the stuff that I've already described. And he said, um, our people have found some stuff in Florida that you're going to be unhappy about. I said, look, we've had one simple view. Whoever deserves to be punished should be punished. Well, he said, let me get to the last line. It's one of, one of the Milwaukee players. I said, who is it? Ryan Braun. I said, well, I understand. Um, do what you have to do. And um, they had so much evidence, and they had so many things. That our, one thing, the brilliance of our drug policy was it was, to this day, I mean, long after I'm gone, fairly administered. So uh, 
it is what it is, and uh, it, um, the only thing I was concerned about for the good of the game and what's in the best interest of baseball. The gentleman in the blue shirt, he's got a Brewers logo, so I guess you get, you get a chance to ask a question. Yeah. You bet. With a Brewer logo, you can ask him all day long. <laughs> Hello, Commissioner. My name is Spencer Bauer. I'm a 1L student here in Marquette. Uh, I've been a baseball player pretty much my whole life, but I was just curious, uh, what do you love about baseball the most? What do you love about baseball the most? He's a baseball player, played baseball most of his life. Well, I, I love the game. I have to admit that. I, I, uh, I'll sit at night and watch all 15 games. And I go from game to game. Um, even when the Brewers aren't doing well, I'll stick with them. No, I'm mad, and uh, you, you wouldn't want to hear the language, but it's, uh, I, it, it, the game gets in your blood. It got in my blood as a kid. And there's just something about it that I just, I love. And I'll tell you, I've been fortunate in so many ways, but fortunate in that I've seen how much good it can do. And all the things that you, I mean, I could sit here all day long and talk to you about my social institution ties. And I, I'm proud. I, I, I'm proud of the game. I, you look at the icons, I'm just a Hank Aaron. I said to somebody the other day, how lucky are we? The greatest icon we have today, along with Willie Mays. I mean, I, I, and they're both great. Never been in trouble, never caused a stitch of problem, never did anything. I'll tell you a quick story. I, I don't know if it's in the book, but it's true. I used to take, on occasion, Robin Yount and Paul Molitor to Children's Hospital. And they're busy, and you know, you're playing in the course of a year, but I talked to them, and they were fine. Rob had one rule. Paul, Paul was great. We'll go. We just don't want anybody knowing about it. Don't want any PR, don't want any announcement. Don't if there's that, I'll never go back again. And I wish you could have seen the look on faces of kids when Robin Yelton and Paul Molitor walked in the room. Yes, sir. Hello, Commissioner Selig, Mario Harmon. Uh, had you last semester. Yes, um, yes so, sir. Yes, sir. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Um, so we had spoken in class about um, the decline in African-American players in baseball from the 80s to now. Um, I just wanted to know, what do you think would draw um, future African-American baseball players to stick with baseball as a primary sport and eventually, you know, get into the minors until the later? Yeah, uh, he's talking about the, the issue of diminishing numbers of, of African-American players in baseball and what could be done to increase that number, to get more kids to continue to play in baseball. Is that kind of a, a fair... Yes, sir. Baseball... Okay. No, that's fine. That's a great that. question, and you know... It, look, we, I've spent a lot of years... Look, when you think about it, let me redo history. You've heard it, but... but Jackie Robinson coming to baseball is its proudest and most important moment. April 15, 1947, Ebbets Field, Brooklyn. Wow. Not only changed baseball, but changed America. Now, I didn't say anything was perfect, so before any... But then came the likes of Willie Mays and Bob Gibson and Hank Aaron and... Tremendous. Then somewhere in the late, mid-late 60s, that dropped off. And I've spent many years trying to figure it out. In fact, if Henry were here today, he and I probably have had 8,000 conversations about it. But here's what we've done. We, put, we built academies in Compton, California, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, Washington, Houston, on and on and on, hopefully here, in the inner cities. And we've worked hard at this. And in the drafts of the, of the last two or three years, we have a lot of first-round African-American kids. So I'll guess what I'm going to say to you. When we see each other in two or three years, I think you'll see, hey, they've done okay. So hopefully we're breaking that chain. 
I am going to, I know you, you, you've been gracious enough to, to uh, take more questions, but yeah. I know there are also some people who've got to move on to their, uh, the rest of their class schedule or also back to their, uh, their business or their working lives. Um, before we go, I, I just want to say a couple things. First of all, um, this is the, the kickoff of the This Falls on the Issue series. Uh, our next event will be next Wednesday. Uh, September 4th, that will be the next Marquette University Law School poll. We have room for you if you'd like to uh, join us for that. That's the first poll we've done here since, uh, the, I believe, since April. And uh, we'll be looking ahead to the 2020 election cycle. A uh, fair num number of questions uh, about the presidential race, as you would expect. But you're welcome to join us at 1215. And then on September 10th, we have the Attorney General for the state of Wisconsin, Josh Call, here. Uh, that is near capacity, but we do have room for a few more folks. So if you're interested, we'd love to have you uh, join us for that. Uh, having said that, I just want to, uh, again, express my thanks, my personal thanks uh, for you being here today, Commissioner. It's always great to see you. And uh, congratulations on this book, For the Good of the Game. It was fascinating. I enjoyed it. And, and if you're interested, there are copies available out in the lobby, signed copies uh, by the Commissioner. Uh, so you're welcome to purchase one on your way out the door. Again, thanks to our students for being here, for everybody else who is in attendance. Good to see you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Thank you.